All right, let's talk about TIAs. It's, this is, I will tell you right now, um, medical legally, um, this is a huge minefield right now, just got to warn you. Um, the lawyers are all over this topic. Um, and we're kind of in a weird place medically about TIAs. I'll, get, I'll sort of tell you where, the, where we are right now with this. But just know that, that if you um, go to medical legal websites and sort of tap in litigation, and all, th this is a big one. This is a big one. So let's talk about TIAs. When, when I went to medical school about a long time ago, a, a while ago, um, TIAs had a definition that basically was time-based. It was a focal neurologic or a neurologic deficit in a vascular distribution or in the eye that lasted 24 hours or less. That was in the 1970s that that, that definition came out. That was what I was taught when I went to medical school a little after that. What happened is they realized that that was kind of dumb, right? That was kind of, where did 24 hours come from? Magic 24 hours, like at 20, if, you, if your symptoms resolved at 23 hours and 55 minutes, were you fine? If your symptoms were 24 hours and five minutes, were you not fine? It was kind of strange. So in 2002, they redefined, there's now a stroke working group, TIA and stroke working group. It's based in Stanford. It's multi sort of um, institutional. And they are, they, what they did in 2002 is they redefined it. And instead of using the 24 hour time window for TIAs, they shrunk that down to one hour. Symptoms usually lasting one hour or less in a vascular distribution to either the, the brain or the eye. Because there had to be a single vascular distribution, brain or eye was involved, and it was one hour or less. That was in 2002. What happened when, around that time is that's when Johnson started to do his research, looking at duration of symptoms of TIAs and risk. That's where the ABCD2 score, ABCD score started. It was about the year 1999-2000. And what they found there was that when they really looked at TIA patients, most symptoms were actually 10 minutes or less. So most of them said that one hour, which is another random number chosen out of the air, it turns out that actually 10 minutes or less was what most TIA patients had, which at the time made it clear to me and to a lot of us practicing that often you have a normal person in front of you by the time they get to you, and you have to trust the symptoms that they had at the time. You have to kind of go by their history or by what was observed by family or paramedics or whatever. You don't necessarily have any hard findings there, which made our job kind of difficult. You had to trust the history, which was fine, but so did your consultants. So did your neurologist have to trust the history. It made things a little difficult. It still was okay. It was still something we could sort of meander through. And then in 2009, the stroke working group changed the definition and took out a time frame entirely. And what they inserted instead is a tissue-based definition. So basically, it is a focal neurologic deficit in the eye, brain, or spinal cord. So now they've thrown spinal cord in there without a time frame, and it has no evidence of damage on imaging. No evidence of ischemia on imaging is what they threw in there in the definition. Now, why do I care? What difference does that make? The difference it makes is several degrees of things. One is, if you have a playing field of a definition of an illness that changes over a 30-year time span as dramatically as this has, where if I were to do a study in 1990, I would be, and I'm studying TIA patients, I'm basing that on 24 hours or less. But then I do the same study in 2002. Now I'm doing that study defining TIA as one hour or less. Or I've done a study in 2012 where now the way I define TIA is I have no damage on an imaging study. Those studies can't be compared, right? You can't compare those studies. So when they've tried to do, the, I tell you, pitfalls right now, meta-analyses that look at TIA data, really a problem because they really are truly mixing apples and oranges here. We don't know how many of those people in the 24-hour time span period had damage done on imaging because we couldn't see it then. We didn't even have the, the technology to do it. So we're comparing apples and oranges in some of this data, which has made things a little bit difficult. That's just sort of a, the playing field deal. And this also re revealed a third entity. What they call this, so, you, so now I come in and I say, this morning for 40 minutes, I had left-sided weakness and I was having trouble speaking, or you know, whatever. I had right-sided because I was having trouble speaking. I had issues that are now gone. 
and you get an imaging study, and let's just say we're in the perfect world, we're in you know, ASEP general or whatever, and we get an MRI, a diffusion-weighted MRI, which is considered the best study right now, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I get that. My MRI, if it shows no damage at all, I am now considered a TIA patient. My MRI, however, if it shows damage, even though my symptoms are gone, I am a new entity. That's called transient symptoms without with, transient symptoms with infarction, TSI. It's basically end STEMI of the brain, right? There's nothing objective that I can find, but there's damage on my scan that is in the same distribution as the symptoms that I had. If I'm still symptomatic and there's damage on that scan, now I'm an official stroke. So now we have this gradation of three kinds of entities that are out there. The problem is what they've done, what the, um, the neurologists have done, is they've taken that middle entity, that transient symptoms, I'm no longer symptomatic clinically, but I have an infarction on my scan, and they've shoved those people over into the stroke group. They want you to consider those strokes. There's a reason for that, and I'll get into that in a minute, but what that's done is the Will Rogers effect that, that uh, we were talking about on the panel earlier. What it's done is taken the TIA patients, where that group used to be in, that, in the TIA group, so the TIAs did a little worse until this group got taken out and shoved in the stroke group, and now the TIA patients are kind of better, right? They're, they're ones that haven't had any damage, and they actually turn out to be less likely to go on to have a big stroke as someone who... Now we've seen the damage, but they're not symptomatic. Now I take this group that's not symptomatic but has some damage on the scan, and I shove them into the stroke group. Well, they also look better, right? So now what you've done is both groups look better. As far as research is concerned, it's made things like risk stratification very complicated. Okay, it's taken these risk stratification things and made it much harder. Because if you're trying to risk stratify TIA patients, but some of them have damage on scan or you don't know if they've had damage on scan because you didn't do the study, it's made it much harder. So we, we're, we're in a really um, kind of moving playing field here. All of the, the pieces of the puzzle keep scooching around as far as what is a TIA and how we define it, which honestly has made, I think, our job a little more difficult in knowing who's at risk which patients are, are in the risk stratification scores that I can actually use, do, or do any of them work? It's made that harder. So this has been a, a significant change in, um, I think, an important one, an appropriate one, but it's made interpreting data more difficult. So that's just sort of where, where the playing field has switched around a little bit. It also is changing the numbers that came out of the original studies. So the original studies that looked at TIA strictly defined on time, not on tissue, they said that is a 48-hour window in the first 48 hours after a TIA, about 5% of patients, 1 in 20, will complete a stroke. And at 7 days, it's about 8%. And at 90 days, it's about 10%. That's based on the time definition of TIA, not the tissue definition of TIA. What we're finding is that if you really can get the tissue definition of TIA, now your worry about going on to stroke divides into two groups. One is the group where all it is is based on symptoms. There's no evidence of damage on a good study like a diffusion-weighted scan. That group turns out to be significantly lower risk for going on and having a stroke. And it is the group that is asymptomatic but with damage on an MR. That group is at higher risk. I don't have diffusion-weighted MR all the time. So now I'm in this weird tweener zone as, um, of where, where am I worried? Which group am I worried about? How worried do I have to be? I don't know. And this is, so this is where things are changing a lot. And, I'm, and I, the one caveat to this lecture is I'm not going to be able to give you, here's the perfect way to approach things because there isn't one right now. There are more um, safe and medically accurate ways of approaching it, but it isn't necessarily perfect. So I just want to give that as a caveat. So that, and one of the reasons is this. This playing field has changed dramatically and is evolving as we speak. What I would love that they, it, what they didn't do, which I would, I would love they had done, is kept the three groups. Give me the no symptom group, no damage group, give me the symptom plus damage group, and give me the no symptoms damage group in between, and now tell me the differences in those. They didn't do that. Okay, they've split them into just two, which has made things really hard. Unless you have diffusion-weighted MR, you're not going to be able to do that. So that's just sort of where we stand. Um, the other issue that comes up with TIAs is not all TIAs actually are neurologic, as far as they're not a, a vascular distribution problem. The next whole set of abstracts looks at mimics. And it turns out that if we all got together and we saw, you know, 10 patients, 
about a third of them would be a stroke mimic. Okay, they wouldn't be a, or a TIA mimic. So TIA stroke mimics are similar. It turns out that most of these, when you, they look at what are they that are these mimics, it tends to be post-seizure stuff or a seizure that we don't know. So seizures, one. Complicated migraines is another. And then metabolic, particularly glucose issues, are another. The three biggies that are stroke mimics turn out to be those categories, which to me what I do with that data is just when I walk away from the bedside of someone I think had a TIA, I'm extra careful to make sure I know what their, their particularly their, their sodium and their sugar is. I'm particularly careful to ask about seizure problems and to ask about a history of migraines either in them or their family, to have some idea of could this be a mimic. That being said, if it's potentially a mimic, you kind of have to divide people into two groups. If it's a potentially a mimic and they are still symptomatic, where it might be a stroke, and now you're in this TPA, do I give it or do I not? I am super careful to make sure that it's not a mimic here. Okay, I, am, I, am, I don't want to be put in the position of having to lice someone who is basically has had you know, a, a seizure and is now postictal or is having sort of a Todd's paralysis equivalent. I don't want to lice that person. So I'm super careful if their symptoms are still there to make sure a mimic's not going on. On the other hand, if their symptoms have gone away and I'm not sure if it's a mimic or not, and it's possibly a TIA, I'm not going to be quite as vigilant because I want to catch potential disease in that group. Does that make sense? So I don't want to lice people unnecessarily if it's a mimic. If I'm not sure if it's a mimic or not, and it might be a TIA, I'm going to assume it's a TIA and work that up. Okay? I'm going to actually make sure that there's not particularly carotid disease, which we'll get into sort of that's one of the more important things. The scales that help you decide mimic or not don't work very well, so those aren't very helpful overall. So and the mimics I mentioned before of which ones they are. Um, scoring systems. So if you go to the American Stroke Association or the National Stroke Association guidelines, and actually the ACLS guidelines has this in their little stroke thingy that's in there, God knows why that's in ACLS, but it is, they recommend using the ABCD2 score. The ABC, it's simple, okay, it was an offshoot of what started with Johnston's research in 1999 and 2000, started with the ABCD score, then it became the AD, ABCD2 score, added diabetes to this, it, whatever, we, you can go look it up, it's not important. I will tell you a couple things, ABCD2, when it has been studied out of the pool of people from which it was derived, doesn't work. You have five papers in here five papers, that, and these were, these were all done out of the original institution area where it was developed. So ABCD2 was developed initially through Kaiser. It was kind of iterated in a single institution elsewhere. It turns out when you translate this out of the initial institutions, it doesn't work. 2009 paper by Schrock, which is in, it's all in here. Okay, it's all in this stuff in here. Abstract number seven. It does not appear useful in guiding diagnostic testing. Perry's paper, the same Perry that did the, the subarachnoid paper, ABCD2 does not appear to be a reliable tool for assessing risk of stroke. 2011 by Stead, provides no useful information. 2012 by Gia, did not reliably predict the risk of stroke after TIA. 2013, it's a suboptimal reliability as far as, it, as far as determining risk of stroke. I would like it to work. But the problem is that depending on your patient population and how this is applied, it misses a low of three and a high of 30% of people that go on to stroke. It's just not good enough. The other sort of sad thing to know is that there are now 30, 30 different risk stratification tools in TIA patients. The fact, the very fact that there are 30 means that none of them works. Right? The very fact that 30 are even out there means that not one of them works well. That's really important. And there's, there's ones out there now that include things like um, adding the imaging to that. Well, to me, why do a risk stratification tool when in the risk stratification tool is all the tests that I'm trying to use to determine if I need to do the tests? I mean, it's gotten kind of wacky. It's gotten kind of crazy. So the risk stratification tools turn out not to be particularly helpful. Okay, they, unfortunately, it just doesn't work. The other thing to know is there's an abstract in here that's number 12 that looks at the dual TIA score. This is not, what, and they define this as more than two TIAs in a week. That's not your simple TIA. The very fact that they had two TIAs in a week puts them in an astronomically high risk category already. So that person, this score to me is just useless. What they're trying to do in this particular paper is determine who needs to get worked up for their carotid disease. 
Okay, that's what they're trying to determine here. The reality is if they're having two, two TIAs in a week, they're getting worked up for me, period. Their risk is way too high. It's basically a, a staccato um, TIA. It's, they're having crescendo TIAs. That's a, that's a concern. There is a Canadian score being worked on right now, so that you know, that's trying to use things that we have available in the ER that are reasonable, not necessarily MRs, because I can't get one. I don't know about you. I can't get one 24-7 that we'll see if it works, but it's just another attempt to try to figure out who is that small proportion of people that's gonna go on and have the real deal stroke, and can I figure out who they are so I know who to work up when? I, I, can't give you, I can't tell you we have one that's good enough. That being said, if that's the case, what, what tests are really important here? So what is important is something to image the brain most of us have CT, it's kind of a blunt instrument, but most of us have CT that'll tell you if there's blood, that's good for that, and it will tell you if there's been old strokes. It won't necessarily tell you if there's anything new today. So that's one way to image the brain. If you have that, fine, do it. If you have MR, get a diffusion weighted MR. Okay, that is considered the gold standard at this point in time. It will show you blood. It will also show you if there's been any sort of cytotoxic damage done. That's what it's meant to do. And again, if there's damage in there, even if their symptoms are better, that's a high risk person. So I want to see if there's anything going on in the brain, blood or ischemia, if I can see it. I also would like to know what the heart is doing. So I'd like to know if they're in AFib or not. So get an EKG. Okay, that gives you a lot of data. AFib or not, watch them on a monitor. And then the last thing is I want to find something that um, I, can, I can address. If it's a problem, I need to address now. That's your carotids. If you have carotid disease that is 90% or greater, you're going to be in the OR rapidly, okay, or you're going to be in the IR suite, but it turns out OR is probably better so far. If you have 75% or greater, you're probably going to be in the OR within 24 hours or so if you have a, a symptom that is related to that stenosis itself. So the workup, I think you can simplify to, yes, I think it's a TIA. It might be a mimic, but I want to make sure I'm not missing a TIA here. So I'm going to lower my bar to do some testing. My testing is going to be to image the brain, however I can do that get an EKG to know what the rhythm is, and I want to image those carotids. And if I'm going to image the brain, I'm going to go ahead and image the carotids at the same time. So what we do at our joint is we do a CT, because I don't have MR, we do a CT followed immediately by a CTA of the head and neck. Boom, one after the other. So I know what the, what the carotids look like, I know what the brain looks like, I get an EKG, I watch them on a monitor while they're there, and see what the rhythm is. The only test left is an echo. Right? The only test left is to see is there a PFO in a young person in particular, or is there a clot somewhere that's gone to the brain? That can be done, and again, the clots themselves, it is a, it's a significant proportion of people who have TAs, but most of it is actually stenosis. It's not throwing clots. So that's something you can do within the next you know, 48 hours or so. The window of time recommended is 48 hours to get the test to see where the problem came from. You can get a lot of those in the ER. What we've done in our place now is we shunt these people to our OBS unit, they get the echo within the 23-hour window of OBS time, and then they get sent home. So that's sort of the approach that we've taken. If you have a place that doesn't have access to this stuff, the decision you have to make is how urgently will you do this? There's some papers in here that say it doesn't make a difference where. It makes a difference when. So you can do it in your OBS unit, you can do it in your ER, you can have somebody in their office do it, but you need to get it done within 48 hours. The window, because we just still can't pick out which of those people are the 5% that are gonna go on and have the real deal in, in two days, the window that's recommended right now is 48 hours. So getting those tests within the 48 hours, however you do it, is fine. But the 48 hours, it's the window that's important, not where they get it, it's the window that tends to be important. So again, it doesn't make any difference where. There's a bunch of papers here from Germany that say you can do it you know, as an outpatient, that's fine. Again, it's the window that's key. How about treatment? God bless whoever back 2,000 years ago decided to chew on the bark of a tree and said, wow, my headache's gone. And little did I know I was helping my heart disease at the same time. Aspirin is awesome. And asp antiplatelet therapy is flat out the way to go. And aspirin is it. Aspirin for a pill that costs nothing, you get a phenomenal effect in heart disease and in TI and stroke. So TI in particular. So give it to somebody. So give them an aspirin. The minute you think it's a, t it's a TIA, and whether you need to see if there's blood on the scan or not is a little bit of a question, but probably get the scan first and then give an aspirin. Have at it. 
you get a tremendous benefit from that. The question is, and, and it knocks out about 90%, eh, a little less, the night of your platelet function. Knocks out a lot, not all of it, but it knocks out a lot of your platelet function. Anybody who's been on a baby aspirin knows you nick yourself shaving, you spend all day dabbing it with a piece of tissue paper, right? It just is what it is. But it's not perfect. It doesn't knock out the va the completely your platelet function. Should we be adding something like clopidogrel? Clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is the neutron bomb to your platelets. It knocks them out. It is remarkable. And should we be adding that to somebody, to aspirin? To, uh, you've had a TIA, I'm giving you your aspirin, but I really want to hit you for all those platelets, so I'm going to add clopidogrel. It turns out the answer is probably no. So the papers that look at this, they start on abstract number 15. It's an Australian paper that says there was no, they, in the paper they did there, there was no distinct advantage at all to adding clopidogrel. Abstract number 16 is the MATCH study, which was actually a relatively um, touted study when it came out in 2005. And they basically said it didn't do anything except increase the risk of bleeding. It didn't decrease the risk of going on to have a stroke. Okay? It, was, it didn't add anything to aspirin alone. It just added bleeding risk. Abstract number um, 17 is what's called the SPS3 paper. That one also found no benefit to adding it to aspirin, adding clopidogrel to aspirin, and it doubled the major bleeding rate by a 1% by a amount. So it basically doubled it from 1% to 2%. It's still relatively low overall, but it still increased the bleeding rate for no benefit. So that one turned out not to be helpful. Then in 2013, a paper came out called the CHANCE study. It's actually, it was in the abstracts that were part of the panel as well. The CHANCE study, basically what they did in the CHANCE study is it was a pretty large patient population, and they compared adding clopidogrel to aspirin in TIA and minor stroke patients. See, this is where it gets fuzzy, right? This is where it gets a little fuzzy. They added minor stroke patients to this, and they found that the combination therapy decreased disabling strokes by about a percent, one in a hundred. Disabling strokes, not just a little ditzel stroke, something that actually disabled you. That sounded pretty good. And they found that the hemorrhage rates were the same in both groups. It was actually low. The hemorrhage rates were about 0.3%, which is lower than what you'll see in other papers. It's pretty low. But they said it was the same in both groups. All-cause mortality, same in both groups. They said, have at it. This is a wonderful thing. It was the first paper that said maybe this works, and, and it led to a pretty big rumble in the neurology community because should we be actually using this? And there were some wonderful editorials that looked at the paper closely and said, wait a second. It was done in China. So it was a Chinese patient population, and, and you know, people are people, but actually not so much. The smoking rate in China is almost double, and actually, depending on where you live, is triple the smoking rate that is in, in any American population, you know, sort of North American population that was studied. So that was different. Their risk of going on to stroke was double than what the numbers were in our patient population here. Um, the doses that were used, of particularly the aspirin, was different than the doses that were used in some of our studies. So it turns out this was a little bit of an apples and oranges deal. So if you are working in China, I have one of my graduates who's now moving to China to work there for two years in one of their hospitals. If you're working in China, maybe you should be adding clopidogrel to aspirin based on that patient population. We're not sure in North America if we should. Okay, we're not sure. There is actually a study coming down the pike called the points trial. Okay, this is actually being done now. So we will know what they're doing is basically duplicating the chance trial in the United States. So we will know within a relatively short amount of time, the, tri the trial is well on its way. We will know within a relatively short amount of time whether we should be adding clopidogrel. Does it add enough that our number needed to treat is good enough that any number needed to harm is, is the balance is worthwhile. We don't know right now. So currently the recommendation is TIA, you get an aspirin, 325 is probably what you should give, not a little one, give a normal one, give them a regular aspirin, and then you're done. Now this is first time TIA, this is simple TIA. This is not stuttering TIAs, this is not I've had a stroke and now I'm having symptoms again, this is not I've had three TIAs in the last month, this is first time TIA. Those are different populations and that's a whole different lecture honestly on what you should do with those folks. This is first time TIA. So know that this points trial is coming down the pike, currently aspirin's the way to go. So to sort of summarize our current status with TIAs, know that the definition is changing and that has changed how we interpret literature and what we do. 
They, um, know that uh, if, they, if they have damage, if you see damage on your scan, if you have a diffusion weighted scan and there's damage, even if they're asymptomatic, now you have to call that a stroke. That's what the, they, they want us to sort of how to follow them. Um, antiplatelet agents are the absolute way to go. Eventually blood pressure management, but antiplatelets are the way to go now. Your workup should include imaging of the brain, however you do that, an EKG, and some sort of carotid imaging on a relatively urgent basis. Since if you're gonna do a CT, do a CTA, you're done. The only last thing left to do is an echo. That should probably be done in the first 48 hours somewhere. Okay, that can be done in a doctor's office. That's absolutely fine to do. So that's the general gist of where we stand now on TIA. Yeah? When you said so part of the problem is you have to know what their problem is underlying of why they have it. So hopefully they've had the workup. Full workups, so echo's negative, EKG's normal rhythms are fine, all that's good. What they recommend doing is either adding, um, either giving something like Agronox, where you add dipyrimidol, or actually adding clopidogrel to that group. And the problem with that is that although it may decrease their risk of going on to stroke, it doesn't do it by much. And if you are already having TIAs on an antiplatelet agent, and you, so you're, you're already, your platelets are knocked out and you're still having TIAs, your risk of stroke is astronomical. It is, it's extreme, it's, so this is part of the, we'll add a medicine, but this is where you start to hang the crepe. You know, this is, unfortunately, this does mean that our, our medicines aren't working as well as we would like, and there is gonna be a risk here for you of stroke. And, there, and, and the fact that you've had another symptom and you're already on this agent says that that risk is now very significant. So you have to start to let people know, because there's not much we can do at that point. There's just not a lot. Adding these agents gives you minuscule changes in their risk. It decreases it some, but they're now in a diff totally different category. So that's where, you, this is where shared decision making comes in because honestly, the benefit you get from adding the drug as far as going on to stroke is relatively small. The bleeding risk is significant. So this is where you talk to the patient. You say, you know, odds are you're gonna get, a, it, it's GI bleeds they get, okay? They, it's, not, it's not brain bleeds, it's GI bleeds they get. And so the odds are you, you may have a GI bleed that gets you in the ICU needing transfusions if we add this agent. And it may not help your risk of going on to stroke. Um, and that's where you have to really talk it out. That's really hard stuff because it's a terrible position to be in as a patient. Yeah. Holter. So Holters, Holters are interesting. Um, no. Um, although right now, so I, I had my first patient with a loop. You guys have seen this loop? So a loop is basically an implanted Holter. And my first patient just a week ago had this. He had this, we had a chest x-ray. It's like, whoa, what is that? There's a thing sitting in his heart, one lead and this little dupe, little, little thing. It looked like a capsule under his skin here. It's basically an implanted holter. And the reason they're doing those now is because intermittent asymptomatic AFib is being highly tied to the risk of stroke. And it's something where if somebody has intermittent AFib, they're putting them on on antiplatelet agents if they're finding that, or, or sometimes novel anticoagulants, which is a whole different ballgame. But that, so Holters in and of themselves, because the likelihood of having the, the episode in that 24-hour window is so small, probably not useful. But if somebody's having recurrent TIAs, it's turning out to be something that people are doing to work them up to see if that's the cause. Is it intermittent AFib that's causing that? Yeah. Is there a benefit from CTA if you have access to uh, kind of No, so no. So if you, so the question is how to image those carotids. Honestly, good Dopplers are fine. The only potential advantage is you'll see disease in a little bit longer length if they have it. You'll see the intracardiac, stuff as well. But that's not amenable to surgery anyway. So this is really what I care about anyway. So that's fine. Yeah. All right. Thanks.